Welcome to Cosmophoto's YouTube, and we're a stone's throw from the world famous British Museum. But if you are into film cameras, and I mean really into film cameras, then you're going to want to take a detour, a couple of minutes walk, and come to the Camera Museum uh, and have a look in their basement. Here we are in the basement of the uh, Camera Museum Cafe in this fantastic room which literally has the entire timeline pretty much of film camera design and history. I'm going to point out a few of the most interesting designs uh, as we take a tour around the Camera Museum. So uh, it starts off here um, with box cameras. The Kodak Brownie was probably the most important cardboard box ever made. It takes 120 film, the same film that you can use in medium format cameras today. You could call them the iPhone of their day. They were small, they were portable, and they were easy to use. And you can see in this display here how the box camera design sort of changed um, through the 1920s, 30s, Right up to the 1950s, looking at this model here, the, the Brown Imperial, which is this wonderful sort of art deco, striking bit of industrial design. We come to the classic sort of vintage camera cliche folding cameras, these wonderful sort of leather or leather effect bellows that allowed the lens to come out. It made the cameras um, more versatile because they suddenly had focusing lenses, um, you know, a, a more uh, sophisticated shutter, you know, possibly um, you know, different apertures that you could choose. And you can see here, you know, 1910s, 1920s, you have these you know, very basic designs. And then, you know, in the years just before World War II and then into the 50s, they suddenly you know, get this wonderful sort of golden age of camera design aesthetic. So as we go down here through the 1950s, uh, you can see that you know most of these cameras have lots of metal still. This is in the age before you know consumer plastics, uh, and you you have some like really iconic designs like the Zeiss Icon uh, Contaflex. I'm going to give a shout out here to this. Um, very odd looking Soviet camera called the Horizont. It's actually a panoramic camera that you would hold with a handle down here. The Horizont um, takes a picture across, I think about two frames of 35 mil film. It is a 35 mil camera, so you can still use that very easily today. Great fun if you wanna try something a bit different. Um, they're really uh, fun and funky cameras. I believe the designer of this camera, he built it in the 1960s, is still alive today in, in Moscow. So uh, if he's watching, thank you. So this little part of the camera museum's display shows how in the 1950s, plastic started becoming used for consumer products. We have cameras like the wonderful Agfa Clack. They're much friendlier looking cameras. They were made to appeal to people who you know, didn't want to sit in front of a manual, you know, making notes and you know, being extra rigorous with their photography. They were designed to load film and to take out, click a button, you know, hopefully get a good picture. Here is where we're starting to enter what I would call the golden age of camera design, the 1960s and the 1970s. Here we still have uh, a lot of really well-made, durable, reliable cameras, uh, you know, made to a budget, but still mostly utilizing metals. Also at this time, you're starting to see things like exposure meters on cameras. As that technology sort of matures, you're seeing even like very, very cheap cameras like this Helena Pellet Electric, which was uh, made by uh, Haking in Hong Kong in the 1960s. I mean, that was absolutely like bare bones budget camera made for, you know, people with like a very modest budget for buying cameras. But in the 1960s, suddenly even cameras like this, 
you know, had those features that, you know, unbelievable to anyone except like the most hardened professionals who'd be using expensive cameras. So here we're still in the, the 60s and the 70s, um, and I'm just gonna point out sort of three notable Soviet cameras. Um, it's Cosmo Photo. We're gonna talk about some, uh, some Soviet cameras. I'm gonna look at the Cosmic 35, which is the um, UK labeled version of the Smena 8 camera. It's probably the most produced 35 millimeter camera of all time. Kept making them and kept making them because they were seen as the perfect beginner camera for kids or youngsters, you know, amateurs. So then we go to uh, this camera, which is uh, the Prince Flex 500. It's actually a Zenit camera made by KMZ in Moscow um, in the, the Cold War days. Um, it's a, a Zenit B camera from the late 1960s, early 70s. But what does Prince Flex mean? Well, Prince Flex um, was the in-house brand of Dixon's, the um, UK electronics chain. Down here we have uh, one of my favorite Soviet cameras, the Lubitel 166 Universal. The Lubitels um, are a range of 120 TLR cameras, medium format. You sort of look through the top, you can see the, the viewing hood here. Um, Lubitels were made from the 1950s um, up until uh, the 1990s and they're even made today because Lomography have um, bought the rights to um, manufacture the cameras in, in China now. A really great way of um, dipping your toes into medium format because they're easy to use, easy to load. Um, they take nice pictures, you know, not Hasselblad pictures, but you know, they, they give you an impression of how lovely medium format is as a, as a format. Still find them um, very cheaply. Uh, 40, 50 pounds tops um, for a working camera, um, which for medium format is, is great because uh, medium format was, you know, after the 19, 1950s and 60s, it was more of a format for professionals, so uh, the cameras tend to be a bit more expensive. So here is a golden age of SLR design, in my opinion, and, and quite a few others. Um, so we're starting off in the 60s with um, beautiful, almost art deco design on this uh, Zenit 3M camera from the Soviet Union uh, through to the wonderful gleaming Konica auto reflex from the late 1960s. Um, the Yashica Electro 35, uh, one of this absolutely enormously successful series running from the the 60s into the 80s, millions of those cameras were made because they had a really good uh, auto exposure system, a, a rangefinder rather than SLR. The ubiquitous Pentax K1000, uh, which, you know, based on the long running and incredibly successful Spotmatic series, it's one of the 1970s Pentax cameras that started using a bayonet mount, lens mount, rather than screwing in a lens like the Spotmatics. Um, another Zenit, the TTL, um, from the late 1970s, um, built like the proverbial bleep, um, and uh, you know has this wonderful Helios 58mm lens, which um, loads of uh, videographers and cinematographers like using because it just creates this incredible out of focus um, creaminess. Uh, bouquet as the Japanese call it. And next to that, um, really interesting camera from East Germany made by VEB Pentagon, who made you know, dozens and dozens of Praktika cameras. This was one of their sort of automated models from the late 1970s, so it's got a electronically um, uh, controlled shutter, which means it's very accurate with exposures. These cameras were actually used on Soviet space missions. The Olympus OM series, what can we say about that? You know, without a doubt, one of the most successful um, camera series of all time. Shrunk the size of the SLR, especially if you look at how small that OM10 is compared to some of the ones from the uh, 60s and, and very early 70s. And packed all of this um, incredibly useful technology in a, in a tiny body. 
um, you know, auto exposure, um, you know, all of the sort of bells and whistles that people were starting to expect in a camera in the 1970s. So if you're old like me, you will remember these from your childhood. 110 cameras, 110 cameras. Uh, it depends on how you want to say it. 110 was a uh, film format um, designed to make loading film easier than 35mm or 120. Um, very, very small um, film frame, much smaller negatives. Um, but as you can see here, there was fairly consistent design. All of these cameras, you know, some of them are a bit more aesthetically pleasing, some of them are a bit more robust looking, but you know, very much form follows function. A real snapshot of camera design in the 70s and 80s and, and, and all sort of sticking fairly close to a, a similar formula. So now we're entering the age of the compact camera, um, the sort of chunky 80s autofocus cameras right at the real dawn of autofocus. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to a few which are like absolutely great cameras if you, if you find them. The Canon 35 ML um, with its wonderful 40 1.9 lens. Um, you can take wonderful portraits on that camera. The Pentax PC35 AFM, we've actually done a video on this camera um, and I'll make sure there's a link to it um, in this video. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful early autofocus camera. And here you've got this bad boy, the Canon Sure Shot Zoom XL. Uh, I've got one of these as myself actually, I've been um, wandering around today uh, shooting it. Absolutely amazing camera, one of my favourite compacts even if it's not, you know, not really compact, but um, wonderful lens on it and, and really, really fun shooting. This isn't the only room in the museum. As you can see, there's uh, another room which has um, displays showing like, some really eccentric camera designs. I'm going to point out the um, camera that was attached to pigeons in uh, one of the world wars to um, try and capture pictures of enemy troop movements. It's also worth um, coming into this room to you know see more of the history of film camera design, you know how the film camera changed over the decades. Uh, you've got all these wonderful accessories and film projectors and light meters, um, all the stuff that you know we don't produce anymore but you know is really evocative of you know the first few decades of the 20th century.